this was a discovery in an airport. I was walking through an airport a couple of years ago, and I saw this magazine called New Philosopher, and I thought, what the heck could that be? I picked it up, and I discovered it was something wonderful. So I became a subscriber, and then earlier last year, I sent an email to the, you know, the editor email that you think goes into some sort of no man's land and no one ever responds. I got a, respond from Zan, a response from Zan Boag's assistants. It was an invitation I had sent to Ken Global. I said, hey, we don't know each other, but I think you'd love this and we'd love you. And he showed up. Some of you might have mentioned, met him last year. We've struck up a good, a good collaboration and friendship. And I, want, I asked Zan to come and make the case for why is philosophy relevant in the 21st century. So to start this, let's roll a video and then invite Zan to join us on stage. Imagine prisoners that have spent their entire lives chained deep inside a cave. They have been chained so that they cannot see behind themselves and they are forced to stare endlessly at the cave wall in front of them. Behind them, a fire is burning, and between the prisoners and the fire is a raised walkway. Now imagine that each day, a menagerie of objects crosses the walkway. Animals and people carrying their wares to market. Their shapes create an intricate shadow play on the wall in front of the prisoners. This is the only world that the prisoners have ever known. The shadows and the echoes of unseen objects. Now, Imagine that the prisoner is released. After some time adjusting to the blinding light, the freed prisoner will begin to experience the world outside of the cave for the very first time. And it is like nothing he could have ever imagined. With his new perception of the world, the man will of course want to return to his friends to share his incredible discoveries. But the prisoners cannot recognize their old friend. He appears as all things do. His voice is a distorted echo, and his body is a grotesque shadow. They cannot understand his fantastic stories of the world outside of the cave. To them, it will never exist. This, of course, does not make the world outside of the cave any less real. Ladies and gentlemen, Zan Boag. So Zan, when we were talking about this segment, you said I'd like to use an allegory. That, that of course, is an allegory. Uh, why, why that? I mean, many of us are familiar with the, the cave allegory from Plato. Why that allegory? Well, it is one of the probably most referenced allegories that um, you would have ever come across. In, in fact, a lot of you probably would have heard it. Uh, or seen versions of it from um, time to time. Look, it, it has been interpreted and misinterpreted a number of different ways, uh, referenced here and there in popular culture, but the two major ways to look at it is either from an epistemological perspective or a political perspective. And I think both of them have their merits. One is going from uh, a state of not knowing to a state of knowledge, of experience, of knowing something about the world. The other one is looking at it from a political perspective, and I think this is probably much more relevant given the climate we find ourselves in now, and it is the corruption and lies of the political world compared to the truth that the philosopher is trying to seek. 
the, the lies of the political world. So that, that brings it very close to home, but let's, let's abstract it a little bit. What, what does the truth that the philosopher's trying to seek mean? What does the truth that the philosopher's trying to seek mean in general, and then bring it down to today? Well, I, I think it comes down to uh, really just a matter of, uh, it, it's hard to simplify something. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, well, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. I, I, probably, I probably need to draw something or I, I need a fancy image here. But uh, really, it's a matter of being aware um, that the way you view the world is not necessarily the truth. The way that you view the world has probably been manipulated by somebody else. Um, and it, is, it could well be nothing more than shadows on the wall. It's a matter of seeking out truths challenging yourself to look at the world in a different way and, and try to find out what potentially is the truth out there. I mean, look, when it comes to a political perspective, it's far easier because uh, they're all lying in the first place. <laughs> um, but I think that is something that we need to... Uh, what he's referring to there as well is a matter of once you do get yourself in a position where you think you do know the truth, it is your duty to inform others, to drag them out of the cave. And I think this is something we need to do with our politicians as well. We need to drag them out of the cave because they're all stuck in there. But they're and really stuck because they're in a system that encourages that kind of behavior. It does. This is not, it actually is a competitive advantage for short periods of time to, to do this. Uh, but without, without getting too political, I really want to come back to this meta question, which is what, what is the role of philosophy? Mm. Uh, people, people often think of it as sort of a dry book. But mm. uh, I, I have to say, I studied a little bit earlier in my life, and, and in the first ins instance in my early 20s, maybe I picked the wrong philosopher to read at the time. I felt like a little bit like Victory. it was, well, somebody I love now, uh, to be honest, but my first shot was Being in Time by Heidegger, mm. and I felt like, no offense to Mr. Easy Heidegger, stuff. it was like reading cement. Mm. Uh, and so I put it down, and then after a while later, I read some of his work on technology, and I thought, wow, this is profound and interesting, and then later went back to Being in Time, and it made more sense to me. But um, so what, what is the role of, what, what could the role of philosophy be in our lives here in the 21st century? And that's what you do at The New Philosopher. It is, and look, I, to me, it's, uh, it's self-evident in that uh, philosophy forms the basis of the very society we live in now. Um, almost every institution that we have, almost every idea that we adhere to in the modern world is based around philosophical concepts. Economics, science, freedom, women's rights, uh, abolition of slavery, education, all of these things are based on philosophical concepts. And I think what we've forgotten or we, we choose to forget is the debt that we owe to these philosophers. It's almost like we're arrogant teenagers now and we're not attributing any of who we are or who we're going to be to our parents. And these yeah. philosophers are our parents. They have formed the very basis of the society in which we live. So uh, to get back to your question though, the way philosophy is relevant is that we are all doing philosophy in some way currently because of the system within which we live. What, what do you mean we're all doing philosophy currently? What well, hey, this, this conference has really given me great faith in where we're heading, in that you know, everyone had a philosophical turn at some point. I was quite surprised to do this. I mean, I know I'm, it's, it's not usually the audience I get to speak to here, a bunch of business leaders, um, and it is a bit of a tough gig to try and convince you of the merits of philosophy, <laughs> but... I think that the job has already been done for me by a lot of the other participants. And I, I heard uh, earlier today, uh, Howard was talking about speed, speed, speed. We need to go faster, faster, faster. Um, you know, Howard's over here. I'm, I'm on the other side of the spectrum. I, I think we need to stop. We need to reflect. We need to think about not what we can do, but what we should do. There are a lot of things that are possible, but we need to have a think about whether we should be doing these things or not. Because we're, we're at a particular point in time in society where yeah, in times gone by, you know, whatever we did affected our immediate environment, family, society in which we lived. These days, there are so many of us with such powerful tools <coughs> that we're able to affect great change on the world. And so we have a responsibility not just to those who are living with us now, but a responsibility to, to those who are going to come after us. And this is where ethics come in, comes in and will be, I, I think, the most important thing as we move forward into the rest of this century is thinking about what we should do. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly something that has been motivating me for at least the past few years, and that is the public, the public di discourse. And one of the reasons I love your publication is the public discourse about, about technology and the future and jobs and all this. And, and by the way, I thought Gary Bowles has, takes a very 
uh, a very nuanced perspective on it. But the public discourse seems to be either we're going to have everything for free and it's going to be fantastic and isn't it wonderful and we'll all have Google eyes all the way to the other side, which is it's all going to come to an end. There'll be a robot apocalypse and we're all going to die a horrible death and humanity is over. And it doesn't seem like there's any nuance in the middle. Mm. There are voices out there. Greg Kolodko has a great chapter in one of his books, Wither the World, all about technology. And in 2013, he was ta that's four years ago now. He was talking about self-driving cars and things like this that people just started to, to wake up to recently. And there are ethical implications of that we're not having enough conversations about. Well, uh, I think what's heartening for me is that I, I can see that conversation happening here and now. It, it is happening. And right. I think that's, that's a huge shift. And it's been part of the reason that our publication has been so successful is that people are interested in this now. I heard Nelly speaking uh, earlier. And, I just need to thank whoever was doing the programming that they didn't put me straight after her. Because yeah. That would have been a no, tough No, Nellie gets a break. <laughs> Always a break after Nellie. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I do appreciate that. <laughs> but what she touched on there, I don't know whether she did it, uh, uh, knowing that she did it, but she was touching on Aristotle's virtue ethics, that uh, intrinsically we have something inside us, a part of who we are that drives our ethical behavior. And what we need to do is if, if we are to get to the path of happiness, which is effectively what we're all trying to do. You know, a lot of people try to do it through money or possessions, but you, know, you quickly find out that there's much more to it than that. But Aristotle's virtual ethics was that we have something within us, and we need to ensure that we bring that out, uh, that we act on that, uh, the, the ethics that we have within us. And it, is the, you know, it means we will do good, we will feel better, and it is the true path to happiness. And Nelly was talking about this. Uh, Ab absolutely. And that is, it couldn't be more practical than that. Because and I hear this from students and alumni and friends and, 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 and all the time, you know, what do I do now? What, what path should I take? Either the path is unclear or they have to make an ethical decision. And this is something we need to be ruminating on for some time. Undoubtedly. You had, a, you had an issue about happiness a while mm. back. And what, what did you learn from the process of compiling that? Well, I learned that we probably should do every issue on happiness because it's sold out in weeks. We've thought about it ever since. Maybe we should just change the magazine to happiness. But that magazine already exists. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, what I learned from it is that it is probably the thing that, that people are most interested in. It, it is uh, almost the meaning of our existence is to find a spot where we're never going to be happy all of the time, but where we can experience moments of happiness as often as possible. You know, a lot of people do that with short-term uh, plays, you know, whether it's through sex or drugs or other means. You know, sometimes it can be through some sort of uh, thrilling experience of some sort, mm. but they're temporary. What we're looking for is some sort of everlasting happiness, if that's possible, or at least a sniff of it to get close to it. So how did you get into this game? I mean, you were sitting around one day with nothing to do, and you said, I think I'll start a magazine. But so what, pretty how much. did you, yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> pretty OK, much. good. Well, I, I was speaking to someone about this earlier, and um, I, I worked in uh, investment banking for a while when I was younger. Uh, uh, and it was something that I obviously, it, it wasn't the right spot for me. I was questioning my bosses too much. I, should we really be doing this? Uh, <laughs> yeah. They kept telling me, you really need to work for yourself. You're, you're not yeah. an employee. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I, I went off to South America for a while, did a bit of soul searching there. I uh, bought a panel van and I traveled around 25,000 miles around South America with my snowboard. Uh, I went around snowboarding and uh, you know, I came up with these crazy ideas of what I wanted to do. But the problem is, is each time I came up with an idea of gathering intellectuals together, it really started to resemble a cult. Mm. So, <laughs> sort, of, sort of like the Ken. <laughs> kind of, no. kind of like the Ken, yeah. yeah. Um, so I had to push that aside, uh, lest I be David Koresh. Uh, uh, and I came up with a, uh, something that I thought people would take more seriously. And I, I did a bit of research on this. I, I uh, initially had some publications uh, that were purely online. But one thing that I found is that when people were reading things online, they didn't seem to take it as seriously as they did something that had you know, a physical copy of something. It was almost though it, it was... Mm, it was meaningless because it was online. They could flick off it in an instant. And we did a bit of research into this as well. Uh, I saw everyone else was going out of print, and I thought, there's an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. you know, there was space on the shelves for us. And you know, while everyone was running for it, we managed to put a magazine together, and we now sit next to Time magazine. 
mm -hmm. and The yeah. Economist, uh, because there was space there. So it was you know, counterintuitive, but it was something that we saw as a point of differentiation. Everyone else was running online. We weren't going to be seen there, and we weren't going to be taken seriously, so we went into print. Uh, and there, there was something poetically right about walking in the airport and seeing that physical, that very beautiful publication um, on the rack. So one philosopher that you admire the most or has affected you the most or pisses you off the most or you think somehow is most relevant for you? Well, I'd why? I'd say all philosophers piss me off and you know, inspire me in some sort of way. It's a matter of, they've all written so much. And but you're not so. allowed to evade the question, just give me. I'm not, I've, I've got one. I, what? Okay, all right. Okay, I've got right. one, don't worry. Uh, it's a matter of finding someone who pisses me off the least or inspires me the most out okay. of a bunch of them. And uh, to me, that's a very easy choice. It's uh, John Stuart Mill. Mm. Uh, and his seminal text was On Liberty. And the, the reason that I admire Mill so much is not just his ideas and the way he behaved uh, throughout the course of his life. Um, you know, he, he was a big supporter of liberty, of women's rights, um, abolition of slavery. Um, he, he really was a wonderful human being, but the thing that made me realize what a wonderful human being was his ability to acknowledge that he does not exist in isolation from others. Yes. That his intellectual output was not just due to his own effort, that he was part of a whole, and the sum of the parts was greater than the whole in his case, because he had a wonderful wife called Harriet. Um, and I'd like to read out something. He credited her to being smarter than him. That's what I'd right? like to read out. And uh, this, this is the reason I like him so much, because he was not afraid to display his By the way, I didn't ask him this question in advance. He just happened to have this thing here. I know it looks like a setup deal, but it's not. It's not. Go ahead. <laughs> Which may, does that make him predictable? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to read this. This is his dedication to his wife, Harriet, who had just passed away before he published this seminal text on liberty, which I recommend you all should um, read. It, it, it really is the basis of our uh, Western society as we know it. To the beloved and deplored memory of she who is the inspirer and in part the author of all that is best in my writings, I dedicate this volume. Like all that I have written for many years, it belongs as much to her as to me. Were I but capable of interpreting to the world one half the great thoughts and noble feeling which are buried in her grave, I should be the medium of a greater benefit to it than is ever likely to arise from anything that I can write, unprompted and unassisted by her all but unrivaled wisdom. Now that's a love letter. Um, So three words, hyphens are acceptable, to describe the role of philosophy in the world. Three words to describe the role of philosophy in the world, hyphens are acceptable. Okay. Uh, to the future, which is a catchphrase, catchphrase that you I use all the time. I've heard and this before. <laughs> <laughs> And, and philosophy really is that. It is a matter of acknowledging the past, uh, acknowledging what has come before us, but using that information, using that knowledge uh, to look to the future. And I, I think more than ever before, it is very important that we are thinking about where we are heading and why we are heading in that direction. And I think philosophy really allows us to do that. Well, ultimately, we must be aware of our vision, visions of the world. Why do we believe what we believe? I think oftentimes we assume that our beliefs and our visions are the accurate ones and have wonder one, sometimes why others have very different views. Yes, sometimes there are crazy people. What does that mean anyway? But shouldn't we use that as an opportunity to challenge ourselves, recognizing that the more we face those challenges, the stronger and better we become, the more robust our perspectives can become, not because they are single-minded, not because they are never challenged and everyone says amen to everything that we say, but because we are so open and vulnerable to that challenge. The greatest good for the greatest number and so much more to the future. Thank you very much, Zan. Thank you. This is great. <laughs>